So yeah, I heard that O in the background there. I actually changed my password to be uh, Torters. Sorry. Wait, you're going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, some, this, this is me. Here's contact info and stuff and whatever. So I actually shortened my password to get people to say O. Oh. <laughs> That's called a troll. Okay, so so really, why do I need to have a longer password than the six character password I typed in up there? Um, uh, I use a different password to log on the server. I don't share my passwords on, on things. So it's just for my local notebook. It's not for like my corporate password. It's not for my home NAS uh, network. It's just a notebook. I have a separate account for full disk encryption that has a 30 character password. I've got no network services on this. So uh, all I want is a wake from sleep password that is very short because I'm constantly typing in every time I open up my notebook, every time my notebook goes into screensaver mode. So I'm typing in a lot. So I want it to be short or easy to type. So, so why the O? Anyone say, so now, is there an O? Is anyone just willing to say why my password is weak and why it's made it longer? Are you on Wi-Fi? I'm not on Wi-Fi. <laughs> Oops. You can see the little Wi-Fi icon up there is, is off. Anything else? Trojan machine and Wikipedia types can be valuable. Possibly, but if you turn my machine at that point, you've got pretty much everything on my machine anyway. Because uh, I only use this machine, so everything on my machine you've got the data for anyway. So, yeah, so there are practical things. There are other reasons why. For example, it's easier so, uh, to shoulder search and find my, my, find my password when it's short, for example. But then my machine's not out of my possession. So the point I was trying to make with this was that we had this idea that your password always must be secure in every instance. And that's not necessarily true. There's reasons why it should be uh, secure, maybe reasons why smaller passwords. Sorry, just got another reason. Uh, that password is typically going to be the same as your OS10 keychain password, which is going to, if, if you ever use that machine on the network, that's going to contain your uh, mail access passwords and other things like that. Right. That's your typical configuration. Yeah, typical configuration, it's true. <laughs> I, of course, don't have a typical configuration. Yeah. Oh, by the way, my password, my normal password is much longer. It's 13 characters, but I shortened it just for this. So um, we also talked about like last FM that we mentioned several times here about how that keeps getting compromised and people's passwords get dumped. My last FM password, by the way, is also very short. It's eight characters and the simple keyword, uh, dictionary word. So um, but I don't care if it gets hacked, but which is why it's short. I just don't care. Uh, so by the way, my, my presentation is about common misconceptions. And I think this, this, this uh, you need a stronger password is a misconception that we have. We're always telling people you need to be as absolutely secure as possible. And what we really need to tell them is, well, you need to care about security for your corporate password or for your Gmail account that you really care when you get hacked. You don't need it for last step down. And of course, as you said, this assumes a lot of typical behavior for people. A lot of people do share passwords among their accounts. So their last FM password is their Bank of America password. And that's why it's bad for them. That's not last FM's fault, that's the user's fault for making the same password. Um, so MD5, I, I hear this a lot, I don't know why. People say, well, you shouldn't be using MD5 for for password hashing because cryptographically it's weak. As everyone knows, people have now successfully created colliding SSL certificates that have the same that collide with the same MD5 password, uh, MD5 hash. So therefore, we know that the MD5 algorithm cryptographically is completely broken. Yeah, that's true. We don't care about that cryptographic principle of MD5 for passwords. Um, collisions just don't happen. 
when we do hash cap, we really don't ever find one person's password. It's not their password, but it happens to collide to the same the same value. There's no you know random dump that hashes the same thing as password one. And the reason is because there's just too many bits that you can't control that are all zero and stuff. And there's no attack that I know of where colliding passwords is a useful thing. I don't, you know, I, I can in theory generate two passwords that hash the same value, but I don't know why. I don't know what attack that would help me with. So what we get from this is that MD5 is just as good as SHA-1, or just as good as MD4. So Microsoft's problem has a lot of problems with NTLM passwords, but the problem isn't that using MD4 and MD4 is broken in the 1990s. It's everything else with Microsoft. Disagree. Yeah. Same. Same. There have been um, there are plausible um, primary image attacks for MD4. That would help with password cracking. Plausibly, yeah. It, it is weak in that way, which MD5 is not. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I don't think it's ever been demonstrated in practice, but there are some theoretical differences. Yeah. This is. And TLM. There's so much more going on that I don't think there'll ever be an issue. It usually doesn't even, but for taking NTLM, for example, if you have a hash and you need to crack, you just pass it and every Microsoft service will just success that. So I don't think there's been a lot of motivation to do any sort of MD4 style pre image attack. Right. Because if you have the hash, then that's the whole It's password equivalent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the MD4 use in, the, in obtaining the ND hash is not really so much for its cryptographic properties as it is sorting out character settings. Yeah. Uh, should we try huh. to concentrate? Uh, I mean, no, I remember we had a discussion. Yeah. My, my point is I had a discussion. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, clear. Um, I'd rather have a discussion and then not get to the last few uninteresting things at the end than not have a discussion. So, so this leads to the because cryptographic is secure. You know what? We're using cryptographic caches. But really, cryptographic hash is overkill. As we all know, we're not cracking the crypto cryptography of these hashes. We're cracking the entropy per, per password and stuff. Um, so for, for 40 bits worth of complexity or 30 bits worth of complexity, we're using 128 bit or 256 bit hashes. That's just overkill. Uh, and indeed, everything that makes something good for, for cryptography is bad for, for hash, for passwords. Um, so Bitweasel had this in his presentation, I was going to talk about this and stuff, about how the real issue for hashing is not the cryptographic strength, it's the idea of attacker versus defender. Um, that, and then and Bitweasel's presentation was awesome. He had a great example of how you added more hashes, but you only added more hashing for the defender, and you didn't actually reduce the complexity at all for the, for the attacker. Well, you're really stupid. I was going to talk about catch act in SHA-3, how it's optimized for hardware. So I was looking at that for password hashing because um, the attacker has hardware, the defender just usually just has x86 with SSC, and that's about it. The attacker has GPUs, FPGAs, ASICs, depending upon what they're willing to invest, and the defender doesn't. So well, we don't really care about cryptographic strength, we care about this the attacker versus defender. So, um, so, we, so we analyze things, our strategies, well, like um, PDK, DF2, well, that's sort of equally slow for defender and attacker. Um, but the defender has more cycles to burn. They, they got web servers at the CPU or idle, so that's kind of in favor of the defender. Um, Decrypt tilts things a bit in favor of the defender just because it's really hard to do on GPUs and stuff. Uh, Scrypt is uh, memory intensive rather than CPU intensive. Again, it's in, uh, it's really hard for the typical hacker. And we don't care that S-Script hasn't been formally um, analyzed by cryptographers because we really don't care about the cryptographic strength of, of, pass of password hashes. So uh, the motivation for this talk was really to talk about rainbow tables. So after the LinkedIn attack, we had pundits. I'm looking at you, Thor. <laughs> Um, or Peter, um, who said things like salt passwords defend against rainbow tables. 
Well, how big of a threat actually is radio cables? So uh, let's first talk about some, some graphs and stuff. So we have our Rockview passwords, and we know, and here's the password size distribution. And we see that eight character passwords are about 20% of the total. Seven characters are 27% of the total. Um, but here's the thing, um, for, for rainbow cables, we don't really care about short passwords, because we can just brute force those. So, um, with the NPL on password, using uh, Hashcat and stuff, it has two hours, seven character passwords on a, whatever system that was, HG6990. We also use rainbow cables for very long passwords, because there's no rainbow cables for a complex password with more than eight characters. There's no nine character uh, rainbow cable until BitMusel creates one with, with GPUs. Was, yeah, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> They're entirely doable, just a lot of resources. Right. So, we, uh, so by the way, I wanted to mention that. Why is there no nine character passage? Um, so uh, as we know, rainbow cables is a, a time space trade-off. And what's the trade-off? Well, so 96 characters password, 96 possible characters to the ninth power is uh, log base two is 60. So 60 bit complexity uh, problem. And the time space trade-off for rainbow cables isn't 30 bits, 30 bits. It's, it comes out to roughly 45 bits, 45 bits, which means 45 bits worth of time, which is one hour of computation using um, Hashcat or something like that, or GPU. And it's um, 45 bits of space, which is 30 terabytes. So that's why we don't have nine character passwords, is we're not going to have 30 terabyte uh, bit forms around you can pass around to everyone. And we're going to need a RAID array, a large RAID array, actually, to store the, the, uh, the table and hours of computation for every password we want to crack. So what we have here is, when you say, like, LinkedIn, you need to salt your passwords to stop rainbow tables, we're really only meaning that 20% right there, that where rainbow tables are not available or they're just not needed. So that's really the only protection. And that 20% itself is not 20% because we'll just use the best 64 rules on rock you and then that dot can you know, minute find 50% of all the passwords anyway. So it's really only that what you need to solve those passwords protect against rainbow tables for is only 10% of the LinkedIn passwords. The other 90% it does rainbow tables doesn't matter. Uh, and even then, that's only if you're not willing to spend 10 days running pet hash cat on them anyway. Because get 10 days hashtag that uh, finds them all. So in reality, for LinkedIn, rainbow cables really wasn't much of a threat. By the way, yeah, rainbow cables, by the way, cracks one password at a time. Right. And so, um, so I'm gonna need 10 days. If I got, if I got a dump of 1,200 passwords, I might as well just use a hashtag anyway, rather than a rainbow table. So I'm doing 1,200 at once. And LinkedIn was 1.5 million or I forget how many. So, so for rainbow tables versus LinkedIn, rainbow tables meant nothing whatsoever. Um, the marginal benefit is blah, 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 it just doesn't make sense. Now, it's not to say that rainbow tables are useless. Of course they are. If I'm a pen test with a notebook computer, uh, doing a pen test, I need the results done in five days, um, and I'm going just for the admin password, yeah, it's, I don't have that 10 days with the GPU power, and blah, 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 rainbow tables helps. Um, uh, the GPU going to nine characters, that'll make a difference. Uh, really like freebrainwithtables.com that uses CPUs that haven't optimized their GPUs, that's obsolete. There's no reason to ever use a rainbow table that's not going to be GPU based. And lastly about salt, is the proper message for LinkedIn is that salt stopped the mass cracking because I have to now do one password at a time for the per password salt. I guess I could do one salt for the entire website that we can defeat the purpose. Yeah, so saying salts are necessary for LinkedIn is good. Salts to stop hash cat and mass cracking, not salts to stop rainbow tables. So uh, another good misconception is we'll, we'll just add, you know, a bunch of uh, GPUs like uh, Jeremy who's gone here or Rick or other people. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the numbers. 
So first, let's think in terms of pure brute force, not getting into anything else. So the, the problem with password cracking is you have this wall that you hit. And you hit it quite abruptly. So people have the idea of, well, if I can crack you know, 1,000 passwords with one hour worth of computation, I can crack 2,000 passwords with two hours worth of computation. And that's not the way it works. Is, you know, this is a great little graph right here of at five character passwords, I find almost instantly, but six character passwords, I might need a day, and then seven character passwords is just off the chart. And so, what I've done here is I've graphed a netbook running an Atom processor, a, a desktop and a GPU, and a cloud with 10,000 machines. And we'll see that the, the, in terms of brute force only, of course, that I will not get a significantly more passwords cracked in whatever passwords format this is. I think it was Shaw 256. Um, the numbers don't come out to that I've really made a big difference by going to Amazon EC2 clusters. I'm still only getting maybe eight character passwords instead of six character passwords. So I can show this that in terms of brute force again, it's we have this area of trivialness that you know, your, your, your laptop will, will find the password. And you have this impact in this area of practicality that no amount of brute forcing, even the NSA with all the computers in the world, or half the computers in the world, still is not going to be able to do much better than where we are already. Uh, by the way, there's an offside. I, I know people try to graph this exponential uh, graph, and their graphs are always wrong, they graph them wrong. So, yeah, you. you this is how you do it. I, I, to get this nice even graph down here with these nice even things, I have 10 samples I, uh, per, per thing here, so it's one, and then I, I do this to the one tenth power. It, it, it works, it, the math actually works out. So in case you want broad graphs like that, to show the exponential difficulty, that's the way the community is. Uh, okay, so the thing is about, uh, so I, I mentioned this in terms of brute forcing, to, to sort of show that we don't ever want to really, beyond having a nice one single GPU, it's not much worth, not much, uh, it's not worth booting anything more. Now let's talk about why it might be. So the, the password distribution, as I've mentioned before, is not even. So let's uh, combine the two of, of brute forcing versus um, the distribution. We see that we don't have an exponential graph. So if most things are eight characters or less, um, I'll actually find those. So with very low amount of power, I'll get further along the graph. The graph is not quite exponential. It takes a little bit. There's more period in the graph. So back here, there's very little point between when I have the password and when it's impractical. That space in the graph is very, very tiny, very, very short between the trivial and the impractical. But in the real world, because we're using things like pattern analysis and pattern mask analysis, we're using um, dictionaries and mutations and stuff. The, the distance between the, uh, the trivial and the impractical is actually much larger. And that's where added GPUs will help, or added Amazon power will help. Is if I'm sort of here on the graph, getting a lot more power gets me over here. But if I'm already over here, where the line is sort of you know, going straight up almost, if I'm here, no GPUs will help me. No Amazon clusters will help me. It's a, I'm, I'm at the brute force point. But down here, I'm sort of at the smart point where I'm doing things more intelligently and GP will help. So I wanted to mention that as just because I'm adding GPUs doesn't mean I'm adding <coughs> stuff. Um, so there's lots of good reasons why you might want them. And one of which, um, for example, is um, um, what uh, Rick mentioned earlier is that gates are cheaper than brain cells is ultimately, if I'm a pen tester, my brain cells are at a premium. And I might spend an absurd amount of GPUs, not because I'm really much, getting much better, it's because I'd rather let, uh, as you said, kick off a job and let it go crunch for, I'm at, I do my pen test for five days, I kick off a job the first day, I come back later on day five, I didn't have to spend any time thinking about it, it went off and did all this stuff for me. And so I might overinvest in, in, in GPU power. So the point was is that just adding more GPUs doesn't necessarily help for the average person. Once we get to people in this room, then it does start helping because we're smarter about things. 
Um, so there's been a lot of talk during the last day uh, about minimum password complexity rules. By the, way, by the way, is there anything people want to say about these things and stuff? They're pretty good for games, too. For <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> As a waste of time and processing it's all around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been watching how uh, the Bitcoin market has gone from CPUs, then SSE, and then GPUs, and then FPGAs, and now ASICs. So I'm wondering, at some point, we're going to have to start creating our own FPGAs and, and ASICs. Like an ASIC that would do uh, NPLM would be like awesome. <laughs> I've, I've talked to people who make big ASIC clusters, and you know, you can talk to talking in, except for like DES algorithms that were really designed for bit operations, um, they're really not that well suited for anything that involves, uh, you know, like generating candidate passwords that involve text manipulations. You know? Right. Um, though, if you look at the Bitcoin mining, it's not too far from password back. I mean, it is pure binary. Your, your rules that you're going through just increment your binary number. Uh, so there's no complexity in terms of selecting new passwords. But um, what we see with ASIC is that an ASIC that costs the same as a GPU performs roughly the same as the GPU in terms of uh, hashes per second, but it uses a fifth of the electrical power. So you save a lot of electricity. And ASICs, the, the power to uh, computation ratio, um, again, goes, goes way up. So the ASICs aren't necessarily a lot faster for the cost, but you're, you're using a tiny fraction of electrical power. If I tell you that I'll have one in two weeks, will you all pre-order lots of them? I would. <laughs> <laughs> of course, even that tech happen, you see what happened with the H6, so they pre-announced and then a year later it's double shipped. I was going to say I'll deliver them sometime in 2020, but <laughs> I'll, I'll just call myself, uh, you know, Butterfly Labs too. <laughs> yeah. well, the problem with FPGAs is the software to really seriously target these things is like one to three thousand dollars to get serious about it. Yeah, and but there that's... are free sample versions for very specific parts. Right. Like to, to program, to take someone's to, to download from GitHub and then to upload to an FPGA is free software. At least all the ones I've done, like Altair and stuff. Well, very specific parts. They they make a special version of the software that's free. But right. Once you want to do like the big parts or the real fast parts, you gotta spend some money on the software. And the Altera software I found pretty feature complete, um, surprisingly, and, and free. It is high quality software. In once the bitstream is written, though, once one person has that software they can generate the bit streams to go out. And that's really what the Bitcoin world has been doing with FPGAs. There's a small number of bit streams that everybody just reuses. So I don't think that's a huge... Well, but if you want to you know, make your own rules for password candidate generation and put it on the FPGA, I mean... But, yeah, we'll talk later, because I'm actually looking along these lines okay. anyway. <laughs> cool. So minimum password complexity rules. So, um, so I had a pen, a pen testing game where uh, the customer said, well, you're not going to really crack any passwords because we have the password complexity federal rules. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't a fail in general because your complexity rules were, were very minor. It was just your typical minimum eight bytes, mixed eight, and a letter or, or symbol. It was meant password one, it was just fun. Um, so yeah, so the result was um, I couldn't really tell if they had any password complexity rules. Um, yeah, you, you sit down with your little rocky hash cat desk before, and then you know, poof, you get half the passwords. Um, and then I, I get in and use GQ power instead of something else. I just did a hash cat job doing eight character passwords, and then went away. Ten days later, come back, and there's nine percent of the passwords. Um, and so that got me to thinking that um, <coughs> one of the, the most important rules is, um, in this, this is the next slide, is at least do nine character policy. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the rainbow tables only go to eight. Um, 
and that a single GPU takes at least 10 days. So the difference between 8 and 9 is huge in that the impact would have on a cracker. Well, 8 character passwords you say in 10 days, is that with a Unicode 6.1 chartset? No. No. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. So you're back to call to use the I'm always wondering about that. It's, it's not too hard to keep people behind, like, you know, even the U.S. keyboards how to put them into a character. Um, just on that, we've had lots of problems. Uh, sometimes it depends on which keyboard we use. So we've had users who were using one keyboard um, where, let's say, you know, oh, Uma was native on the keyboard and another one where it was an alt thing and they're some we're just treating them as these octets. Well Windows has that thing with the all a key and the numeric keypad that you can type in any key code. Yeah. So all one three nine is a A and U or something, I don't know. Right, but people were were getting different results on different systems with different keyboards and stuff. So we just had to tell. Yeah, people. I know how to type it on a Mac. We, were, we just had to tell people, no, it's really easy to do on a Mac. It's just sometimes it comes out differently. Yeah, I know how to do that. So we just. Had but to tell it, it, but the simple business, I mean, there are some guys that are doing hardware. So I mean, if somebody could just make a Unicode 6.1 keyboard, I'm, you know, I want one. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got a lot of keyboard. I mean, that is just natural language version of Leeds Keepables. And Leeds Keepables have never stopped us from cracking anything. If you do the E to 3, that didn't stop anyone. And, and all of the rules target that. And so if we allowed Unicode, we would just think of it as a, a Unicode style Leeds Keepables, and we'd, we'd still go right through it, no problem. Because you're not typing every single character in your password as some sort of Unicode character. You're not using super strange symbols. Some people will, but most people are going to put umlaut or an accent, and that's it. What if well, you like if both wrong? English and Chinese or something? So you had a password that was composed of both English and Chinese characters. Would it, does anybody here have rules that would find that password in brute force? <laughs> so what you're saying is, every corporation in the United States has a good password complexion rules that at least one Chinese character. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in terms of the individual user, you know, what would best fit to them? Well, just, just in response, uh, we're not really expecting people to uh, type passwords. We'd like them to use passwords they don't memorize, which are random and maybe very long, and they're not going to have to type. So right. if they're using a generator that kicks out Arabic, Chinese, and Polish characters, as well as English locale. And that's, that and that's exactly what I was requesting great. yesterday from you and from Jeff. Yeah, I know. I'm going to work on it. He is too. <laughs> yeah, I just want to make the really quick, obvious point is that, OK, Suppose you could get everybody to add a Chinese character. How long is that solution going to work? Designing so things. No, no, no. Designing things is against it. You ask, do people have rule sets to do such and such? If everybody started <laughs> making passwords differently, the rule sets would change in a day. Yeah. 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 I tried using like uh, Unicode characters back in 2000 something, don't. <laughs> Services like Google and Yahoo, which actually this happened to me, I typed in my password and then they changed the character encoding and then I couldn't log in. If, if you look at the, the rock you set, by the way, the wrong which we all have, we all on our disks, if you go through there, you'll find there's actually some password with Unicode in them. Where the, there's different encodings for Unicode. Some are like UTF-16, some are UTF-8, or some are um, uh, Windows character sets and not Unicode. So you go through the password and try to figure out what the heck is going on here. It's because they had different character sets. We had a problem a few years ago when uh, PGP updated and uh, our password didn't work anymore. We could not decrypt anything. Because they were. Because they changed encoding. Uh -huh. well, it was no no ASCII, but like in France, we have all the home loads and all the other home loads that sense. And then they changed it. They all, when I say, oh my god, we put everything in, uh, in Unicode. And then when the password didn't match anymore, and it didn't work. And very recently, it has nothing to do with that. With PGP, uh, later lessons started to not decrypt anymore attachments from emails that came with, from someone who had a new note in his name. 
that, but, nice. but I don't know who they could do that. Yeah, the, 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 um, I think it's a Spanish word for password is a, a senya, and it's got a tilde on the end, and so you go through password corpuses and you'll find that there's, there's different ways they can go at the end. And you know what the end is, you know it's n tilde, but when you see this binary character, it's like different character sets. And that's, I find that quite interesting, that it just doesn't work still. So if I could summarize the variety of comments I've heard, make sure I'm understanding it right. If you're using Unicode as just like a, a, uh, a U with an umlaut for every set, uh, uh, substitution for a U, you're not really going to be helped. If you're using Unicode in random passwords, you will have a larger key space, but you run into these horror stories that people yeah, are sharing yeah. or unpredictable things. Is that kind of the gist of what people are doing? Yeah. Yeah. The passwords would be incredibly good, but it would be complete hell to actually use them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're secure. Nobody can log in. <laughs> 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 it's secure. And that's a problem why. So I would say also with Unicode, don't forget all the software bugs, including the GeekCare library that turns into question marks. Yeah. Um, so you can shoot yourself in the foot trying to be secure just because it's Yeah, there was a system that did that. It treated like all the Unicode characters as all the same characters. So you have that. No, we, we have to go after all the web developers and application developers for that. And I it's not a password problem, it's a stupid idiot problem. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I had here was the, uh, the idea of how many... Sorry, before you move on to the next slide, I just want to talk, um, make a comment about your point uh, about uh, at least nine characters. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it helps against rainbow tables, but we just talked, you or you just talked about rainbow right. tables. Or just that level patch guy is right at the But, I mean, like, Rick, I mean, how, like, much are, against nine characters do you get with masks? Like, 90% in, you know, yeah. a short period of time? So, I mean, increase it to nine characters, like, oh, you know, it makes it harder. It doesn't really make it for the well, majority of passwords harder. When I look at the jumps that would happen, it, it increasing any one character, you go to 15 characters, my masks and my patterns and my, uh, my word lists and stuff, I'm still going to get them. So any one jump is going to be small, no matter what level we're at. I just wanted the eight to nine jump is, is larger than the other jumps. It's still bad, and I care if I'm still going to easily do it, but it seems to me it's a larger jump. And the reason you're not picking 10 is, is that that would be too much to ask Well, the nine to 10 jump is, I think, smaller than the eight to nine jump. Yeah, eight to 10 is even better, but I'm trying to say the marginal benefit you're of the trying to get something that your, your client will actually agree to. Right. Yes. And the eight character is like, I don't even notice you have the eight character minimum. It is just, by any measurement, it's a notice it. Yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, as a pen tester, uh, one of the most horrible thing I've actually found out over the number of years is the companies that I had the hardest time breaking into all had three character passwords. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go that low, you didn't even try. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's simple from, from a group. For standpoint, how often do we actually try three character passwords? Uh, we don't. We don't. So uh, did the hash cat in the old days automatically did seven characters and just brute force one through seven? And then did no, not not, not so really online. Online, 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 not online, not against the list. Online. Online. Okay. So so if we had that, if we had the hashes, you know, game over. Simple as that. Uh, you know, who cares what the password is? We can do pass the hash. And, and, right, there's other stuff. Yeah, and, right. and compromise the customer, but but from when we're dealing with with actual passwords, uh, there, there's two areas that I see the biggest level of security uh, value in is shitty passwords, three characters, because I never brute force those. Because who, it's never who, 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 who the hell's going to get a three character password? Uh, and, and the other thing is is passphrases. Uh, customers that actually utilize passphrases, uh, where they they get away from you know the Windows, you know egg characters, uh, alpha numeric, uh, uppercase, lowercase type things. Customers that follow that policy uh, from a password perspective, uh, uh, I rarely don't compromise. Uh, right. You know because because they all use either you know summer thirteen, winter thirteen. You know the, these common standards. Uh, so, so, so from a from a password perspective, it's either really bad passwords, three characters, which I have a hard time guessing because I don't think that's stupid, uh, or or they use passphrases, which is a big benefit, uh, right. where they have to 
little sentences with spaces and things like that, which are easy for the customer to remember. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, Unicode, Unicode pop. Hell, Dan Michael. Tim, I'm going to the next one because we're at 1241. Yeah. So, uh, so Jeff Rusak, he had talked about the, the bits per character, and he had low opinion of bits. And so, I already had a presentation, so I can just repeat what he said. Um, uh, so NIST had this theory, by the way, of there's only like 1.2 bits of entropy per password. And um, first of all, that's a stupid theory because they didn't release a tool that exploits that. If you're saying it's 1.2 bits of, of password complexity per, per character, great. Give me a tool, I can use it against a password thing, and that'll be great. I'll believe you. I think that estimate came from standard English text. Yeah. Again, it's, but there's no tool that exploits it. Sure there is. I mean, yeah. Well, now we have tools, not the myths, is one of my points. Sure, exactly. yeah. um, and so, but there are also other obvious theoretical problems. Of, that there is, there are some like even distribution of stuff. Um, and that's not how passwords work. Um, yeah, sure, so many passwords have 0.1 bits complexity, but running rock units gets out of measuring. Um, and a few passwords have, I don't know, 7 bits per character. I mean, they're totally random. They're chosen by a random number generator, and that 7 bits per character complexity. And you can't, you can't average, you can't say that overall passwords is a certain complexity, because it doesn't mean I'm getting 100% of the passwords on my cracking tool. I'm still only getting 50% of my first pass with the rock you and best 64 rules, and I'm only getting up to 90% with my, my careful patterns and other stuff. I'm still not getting 100%. So there's no measurement that I can really say that there's n number of bits of event uh, per per password. That's really an invalid concept. Uh, so the, the valid concepts are things like looking at Hashcat and the tools uh, that come with Hashcat, uh, the PAT tools and the Markov chains and the other stuff. Measuring those, how they work in the real world, is really our measure. We need to find better numbers, better ways of measuring this other than the, 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 the NIST idea of so many bits per character of entropy. Um, so I don't know how we would generate those numbers. So this is my final item, um, and we discuss this a lot, um, that um, you can't fix stupid. So a lot of the discussion is assuming that maybe we can find a better way to, of password um, rules, for example, uh, that 12, 2, 2, 2, 1, of upper, lower, digits symbol, and minimum is 12 characters. Okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make people smarter, but then they're really stupid. They just still do the dictionary word, capitalize the first two characters, or two words, capitalize the first character of each, and then put a digit or a couple digits in between, and call it good, and our, our rules catch that in seconds. And it's because our rules that we use, where we're not hacking the computer, we're hacking their mind, and their mind is stupid, or we're hacking the stupid. <laughs> um, and so we need to actually say at some point that this is unacceptable, that this is never going to work. We can sit here forever, create better and better tools, and you know, the ones we had yesterday were a pretty good tool for fixing stupid, but it's still, stupid still gets through. So, um, we need to say, well, that's just, this is broken. That idea is, this is broken. And just accept that that is broken, we're dealing with a broken system. And, and things like, uh, I was mentioned in the back earlier, uh, why, you know, why not just select passwords for users? So you, you give them random passwords, only eight characters, or nine characters, but totally random, and that's something that I really have a hard time breaking. A nine character, totally random number generated, I'm not gonna crack. Yeah, I could with me enough years of GPU crack with hashtag, I could with brute force, but in practice, I'm not going to do it. And so, if, so that works, and we need to accept that as an idea that, well, that does work. I do have a solution, which is don't ever have people choose their password. And you look at things like two-factor authentication, and that's what two-factor authentication is really doing, as uh, Rick discussed earlier. Uh, uh, passwords are broken, they're completely broken, I'm always going to crack them. So, and when, that's why people move to two-factor. It's not two-factor for all the other reasons people choose two-factor. It's really more one-factor, that the factor of password is kind of meaningless, so let's give them a factor that actually works. 
So if we all had a pin number of 000, but a key fob that allowed me access, that's secure, that works, that generally can be hacked, at least not the way that we're all hacking systems today. So one factor authentication where that authentication or that factor isn't passwords is a workable system that would then sort of just obsolete this entire conference. Um, and there are people who, who do that concept in reality. Uh, so for example, if you've got a project on code.google.com uh, and you want to save your SVN password to the disk, for example, it gives you a random number, gen it generates a random number for you. And the reason it does that is because you're saving that password to the disk, there's a good chance to compromise. You're using protocols that might not be secure, so there's a good chance to compromise. So they don't use your real password to manage your code. They give you one just for that code. So that limits the compromise just for that code, and you don't need to be memorable because it can be saved to disk. That's the whole point of having the password is that it will be saved to disk. So that's a, a good workable system. GitHub should do that. GitHub doesn't, but they ought to. Uh, some SIP things do this, the same sort of thing, is the keys that they give you that you use to manage your account are different than the, the, your public um, phone number you give to people. That's not what you log into to manage your account. The, um, the, the secret key that it uses to do your phone registration, again, that's just for the phone registration, registering where your phone is, that's not the secret key or your password that you use in your account. It's a machine generated thing that you type in once into your phone and forget about. So, so, so the idea of let's whenever we can find a way that we don't need people to choose a password, let's do it. Let's generate something for them. Um, along those lines of let's stop admitting, let's stop recognizing that things are broken, is the thing about NTLM. We often act like. You have a question? Uh, yeah, by, by randomly generating people's password, aren't you just like increasing your post-it ratio, I guess, where people are more, more, more likely to start to write it down because it's too complicated? Yes, except for these two cases I, I mentioned uh, for the XDM password. Right on this. Is that saves disk, and then this one's going to save your phone. Okay. So here are two examples of where they found a reason why they didn't need to memorize them, so don't let them choose it. If they don't have to memorize it, don't let them choose it. And then there's got to be algorithms that we can choose passwords for people, like um, syllables or something, that we're going to give you a complicated password, and it's not going to be necessarily a complete jumble. It's going to be easier to memorize, maybe 20 characters maybe, but things and ways you can memorize it that we're choosing things for you rather than you choosing it. Or there's got to be some way we can negotiate that. But still, like uh, others have said, I write them on my passwords. They're all written down. Not in a post-it note, of course. Not where you can find it. <laughs> um, so, anyways, so back to the same concept of we, we kind of deal with Windows NT11 because they exist and we have to, but really every time we say NT11, we need to say that that thing that's completely broken and it should not exist. Um, and it's broken. I didn't have any actual content on that because I don't need to reiterate why it's broken. NTLM V2 is slightly less broken. <laughs> so the Moss Mars part of the thing last year was because it's broken when you use it across the network, it's broken when you have path the hash, it's broken all sorts of different ways. So we should just all say yes, it's broken, and it's unreasonable. You know, Microsoft should issue an advisory saying yes, NTLM is vulnerable, we're gonna patch it. We're gonna happen, of course. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> So uh, that's the talk. Anything? Um, if you're writing down all of your passwords, can you give me just approximately how many there are of them and whether you're ever tempted to reuse passwords? I reuse short pa I reuse short passwords all the time, like on last step then, other stuff. Uh, things I don't care about. Things I care about, not only do I not reuse them, I don't reuse the same underlying base things. They're like big things. I try to find random things. Like um, on this thing, um, one reboot, sorry. Um, you'll notice the name here is Martin Whitford on my computer. 
But because I got this computer, I went to a bar, I opened it up, it asked me what my name was. And there was a little thing there on the bar, and it was um, like Martin something wineries and Woodford beer or something like that, on the little advertising thing at the bar. So I chose that as my login name. By the way, I never tell my real login name for things, but I don't have to. So my last FM account, um, my password is actually FUBAR123. Um, good luck using that because you won't know what my username is because I don't lie, I lie to it. Okay, so you don't use the Gravatar with it. I use Gravatar with it. So I know the Gravatar account I do use with robertdavidgramming.com and you can crack that. If I ever were to make anonymous comments using something else, it would be random IP or just email addresses or for mailing it or crap like that. Okay, everybody, this is my GitHub password. Okay, I hope none of you have like Superman vision. <laughs> <laughs> my camera does, hold on. Right. <laughs> like, I can't remember 15 digits for all 40 things that I have accounts for. Right. I have to write it down. Uh, right, and so I try to write it down. So there's like 20 that I've got written down, so there's 20 things I really care about. And the rest I don't care about. I use Derive and Kubar 1 2 3 most of the time. If you go crack something like Strat 4, you find through our one great main game. And I forget because I, I change it every year. I, I started using a correct force battery staple generator. You know what? what? A correct force battery staple? Does swear. Oh, the XKC one. Yeah, yeah. I, I started generating my passwords to be a series of vocabulary words. And so it's more memorable for the same entropy, I think. And I, I think cognitive science research shows the same thing. The, you know the seven plus or minus two rule and uh, how many things people can keep in their working memory? Oh yeah. And it doesn't matter that much uh, how big the set guy is or big guy. You can remember about seven plus or minus two digits and you can remember about seven plus or minus two vocabulary words. It's not, it's not completely uncorrelated, but you can get more information with that. So I think that's the most nice way to bring it up for your session. We gonna break it off. That uh, Bobo, will you keep with us? I'll be here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there will be no small opportunities to talk to Robert as well. So I, you know, thank you again.